are the Ad Watchers? We are attorneys at the National Advertising Division of BBB National Programs, a team with 50 years of experience investigating and resolving disputes over the truthfulness and accuracy of national advertising campaigns. To make sure advertisers can back up what they are telling consumers, we don't just take ads at face value, we put them to the test. Why? Because advertising law is simple. It's the execution that's hard. Welcome back to another episode of Ad Watchers, NAD's podcast that gives a view into how our organization reviews claims and applies advertising law. If you missed any of our previous episodes, don't forget to check them out later. They're available wherever you are listening to this. My co-host today is NAD Assistant Director Annie Uger Lyon. Annie, today we're doing something a little different. Yes, we're switching gears on our podcast today. Our episode is going to cover the ins and outs of our sister organization, the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council, or DSSRC. Our guest is Peter Marinello, Vice President and Director of DSSRC, and he's a well-recognized champion of advertising self-regulation with over 25 years of experience in this space. He started as a staff attorney at the Council of Better Business Bureau's now BBB National Program's National Advertising Division in March of 1993 and later became NAD Associate Director in 1998. He has authored thousands of decisions on a wide range of topics and has spoken on behalf of advertising self-regulation at trade conferences and workshop seminars throughout the country. He has also authored a number of articles regarding advertising self-regulation in many trade publications. Before he joined BBB National Programs, Peter practiced law for six years at a general litigation firm in New York City. He received his bachelor's degree from New York University and JD from St. John's University School of Law. Welcome, Peter. Oh, thank you so much for having me. That was such a kind introduction. So, Peter, DSSRC is relatively new to the self-regulatory world. Can you tell us a bit more about it and why it was formed? So, Eric, the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council launched in 2019, really at the behest of the Direct Selling Association, who was very concerned with some of the egregious product and earning claims that were being disseminated in the industry and, and really giving the industry a bad name. And, you know, like many industries that have turned to self-regulation in the past Over the last couple of decades, really, the direct selling industry has really found itself in the crosshairs of state and federal regulation. You know, we saw some very high profile and well publicized matters. And the industry is really confronted with these perception issues, right? Both from consumers and regulators. Perceptions which really compromised the integrity of the industry as a whole. Now, there are two specific events that really kind of resonated with me. Uh, And both occurred, incidentally, at DSA conferences, and both also involved the then chair of the Federal Trade Commission. So back in 2016, I'll say, you know, I was in the audience at a DSA event, and then acting FTC chair, Edith Ramirez, really kind of wagged her finger at the industry saying, hey, if you guys really don't get your house in order, We're going to come in and really impose some tough regulations that are going to uh, chill the way that you guys are conducting business. Those comments were reinforced a couple of years later by uh, acting Federal Trade Commission Chair Maureen Olhausen, who essentially said, we understand you have your code of ethics internally. And while that's very encouraging to bring real credibility to what you're trying to do, You really should be going to an independent outside third party to administer uh, this self-regulation program. And that third party ended up being BBB National Programs, which ultimately led to the creation of the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council. Now, I think that there were some other forces at work here as well. You know, the industry was dealing with with bad optics, really, from social media message boards and some of the consumer advocacy organizations, such as Tina.org, for example. But I think one of the benefits of this scrutiny was that it really kind of galvanized the thought leaders uh, in the space and helped them recognize that they had to proactively uh, address some of these issues. 
And, you know, the FTC came out with this guidance for multi-level marketers back in 2018. And I think that that really helped frame some of the issues that could be addressed in the context of a meaningful, independently administered self-regulatory program. Yeah. So, Peter, how does DSSRC differ from NAD and other self-regulatory entities? Yeah. You know, Annie, there are a few things at work here, I think. Um, You know, NAD has always been held up as the gold standard of advertising self-regulation. And as you mentioned, you know, I was at NAD for about a decade, many, many years ago. And when we created the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council, I think we needed to recreate some of the hallmarks, right, of what made NAD so successful over the years. You know, transparency, having an objective standard of review, uh, accountability, things like that. So when we originally started the program, we figured it would be a kind of a case repository very similar to what NAD is, but it really didn't turn out that way. You know, 95% of our cases come from our own monitoring of the industry. And I think one of the key differences between DSSRC and NAD is that we contract with a third-party monitoring vendor that is looking at social media posts every day, and they provide this portal for us that we go into daily and review the identified posts to keep our eyes open for problematic claims. You know, the DSSRC also publishes uh, industry guidance documents, such as our earning claims guidance for the direct selling industry which we recently revised, oh, in June of this year, just trying to reinforce the fundamental principles of claim dissemination. We include a number of mock examples that demonstrate how to and how not to communicate product and earning claims. You know, lastly, the funding model is is very different, right? Unlike NAD, which is funded primarily by competitive challenges and industry events like the NAD conference next month, DSSRC is funded by one source, the Direct Selling Association, which I think demonstrates really how committed this industry is to meaningful and effective self-regulation. You mentioned earlier that you find cases often through your own monitoring. Once you start a case, can you sort of take us through what happens in in a typical case and how you work with the business? Yeah, yeah, sure, Eric. So when we open a monitoring case, really the first thing we'll do is we'll go into our monitoring portal and see the type of claims that have been identified by our monitoring vendor. So we'll take a look and see if there are several posts coming from one particular company, and perhaps there may be a pattern of behavior that we're seeing. Okay, so if we do detect a particular pattern of behavior with posts from from one particular company's Salesforce members. What we'll do is, we'll first determine if they're a DSA member or not a DSA member. Reason why I say that is because if they're a DSA member, then we have contact information for them. If they're a non-DSA member, it becomes a little trickier. Then we'll have to go to the website, try to see if there's contact information, if there's a support email, if there's a telephone number, and a lot of direct selling companies, again, outside of the, the realm of DSA, A lot of non-member companies don't have that information, which makes it really challenging. I'm fortunate because I have two colleagues, Howard Smith and Joanne Lee, who do a fantastic job of figuring out where we can find the company and where they may be headquartered. So once we find that address, particularly if it's an email, a lot of times it's funny because we're all working in a remote world, right, for the last three years or so. So if we what we've done is started to open cases through email. If we find an email address for a non-member company, we'll shoot them an email, we'll list the claims, we'll list the reasons for our concerns, we'll list the response date. Sometimes they don't respond. And in that case, we'll send a hard copy out to where the company is headquartered just to make sure that we're doing our complete due diligence and giving them an opportunity to participate in the process. A lot of times what we've seen is once a company is notified about certain product posts or earning posts, they generally don't know about them. You have to remember that some of these direct selling companies have hundreds of thousands of Salesforce members globally marketing and selling the product. So I may be dealing with general counsel here in the United States, 
and I'm identifying a social media post from the Philippines that they have no idea about. Generally, they'll take these posts down right away. If they don't, and when, by the way, if they take these posts down right away and it's their first rodeo with us, we'll generally administratively close the matter. However, it's, if it's their second or third time now through the process and we're detecting something more systemic going on, it's going to flow into a, a much more detailed type of case. And then it almost mimics the NAD process. Companies given an opportunity to submit a response within 15 business days. We generally have 10 days then to reply back to them. They have one last chance to provide additional information. And then we go through our case analysis. We write up a, a decision, give them an opportunity to submit a statement stating whether or not they uh, they will adhere to the recommendations of DSSRC. If they do, fine. That's great. There's an opportunity. We do have an appellate board. They can appeal the matter to the DSSRC appellate board, which, by the way, we haven't received any appeals now in three and a half years of administering the program. And then, of course, the, the nuclear option here then is unfortunately a referral to the Federal Trade Commission, or what I really should say is the appropriate regulatory agency. Most often it is uh, the FTC. So that's how the case flows. So you mentioned that most of your cases are monitoring cases, but do you get some challenges? And if so, are those ever an anonymous challenges or, or can you just talk about those a little bit? Yeah. Oh, Annie, you bring up some such great points too that I just want to touch on. You bring up the anonymous challenge provision too. You know, I had administered another self-regulatory program way back when called the Electronic Retail and Self-Regulation Program. Great program. <laughs> Annie, we had this great provision in there where companies could bring cases anonymously to us, and companies really availed themselves of that opportunity. I think 85% of those ERSP cases were brought anonymously. I thought it was a great idea for this industry as well. DSA was a little bit more reluctant about it. I know we're still potentially having those conversations. Yes, we do get some competitive challenges. We had a great competitive challenge back in 2020, I want to say, involving two CBD companies that got very granular with respect to to some of the various uh, certificates of analysis regarding ingredients in the CBD products and, and things like that. Tina.org, we had mentioned them earlier. They've also brought several challenges to us over at DSSRC, but it is primarily a monitor-driven program at this point right now, though, yeah. So let's talk for a minute about the direct selling industry itself. Some of our listeners may not be familiar with how the direct selling industry works. Can you tell us a little bit about that industry and how the challenges it faces differ from other industries? Yeah, Eric, you're so right. It is a very different type of business model and industry uh, from things that I think NAD and probably yourselves have certainly seen. Under a direct selling business model, Sales of products and services generate revenue through a network of salespeople who sell directly to consumers. Now, typically, no fixed retail uh, location exists, no brick and mortar uh, setup exists at all. Instead, it's the individual salespeople who are connected with a larger parent company and given the tools to become individual, let's say, entrepreneurs. How about that? Direct selling takes place through presentations or demonstrations of a product or service in a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, or maybe during a hosted party at a prospect's home or business. Business owners in direct sales earn a portion of their sales with the company uh, providing the product, obviously, and they retain some, uh, some of their remaining revenue there. You know, there is also this recruitment, right, of salespeople who also do the selling. You know, one Salesforce member can create its own downline team where they receive a piece of the revenue generated by the Salesforce members that they recruit. That's what makes it, I think, a very distinguishable from the traditional models that we see. You know, the rule of thumb here, though, is that a majority of the revenue that Salesforce members earn must come from product sales. And that could include their own personal consumption, by the way, rather than the revenue generated from the Salesforce members that they recruit. So it's more about selling the product in terms of revenue, less so than the revenue that the salespeople that you recruit receive. 
you know, with respect to challenges, let me touch on that just for a second. The longtime allegations of pyramid schemes, right? It's hounded this industry for decades. But I will say that the reputable companies, most of which are DSA members, they've been able to overcome this type of stigma. That is with the sale of of actual products with a real consumer demand uh, and ultimately consumer sales. Now, one last piece on this, Eric. The FTC has been really closely scrutinizing earning claims communicated by direct sellers, um, really their sales source members, and the amount of income that could be generally expected from someone interested in the business opportunity. But here's where it gets a little bit ambiguous. You know, people avail themselves of a direct selling opportunity really for two reasons, to get discounted prices on, on products and services, or to start their own business and maybe earn a little bit supplemental income. However, some people may try the business opportunity for a while and then stop, but they still want to receive products at a discount. And so for purposes of figuring out the amount of income that could be expected from the business opportunity, the big question is, should those people who are no longer interested in selling product but still want their discounted products, should they be part of that rubric, right? Uh, That rubric of what type of income can generally be expected? That's why there's this big push for what they call segmentation of the industry, really kind of delineating who's in it to build a business, who's in it just to get nice discounted or wholesale prices. Big challenge in the industry, Eric, right there. So what are some of the trends that you see in this space? Are they different from, let's say, things that NAD might see or other programs? And are there key target areas or or, or cases of note? Yeah, you know, Annie, it's funny. You know, one of the things that comes to mind right away in terms of trends uh, in this space is the status of the independent sales person. There's been a lot of chatter, particularly out in California, about these sales folks, these sales force members, being so affiliated with the company that they kind of lose that independent status. Now, that's not a dog that DSSRC necessarily has in the fight. Again, our jurisdiction is product claims, earning claims, but that's certainly taking a lot of regulatory bandwidth within the industry. The other thing that I know NAD sees a lot is this influx now of of CBD products, right? And there's a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace regarding the permissibility of selling these products at both the federal and state level. Now, everyone has been waiting for some clarity from the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, who had intended to provide a regulatory pathway for the sale and marketing of CDBD products three or four years ago. But I think with COVID, the priority uh, level has lessened a little bit regarding the attention that they give to CBD products. But meanwhile, The CBD industry is in a state of flux, and you guys are seeing it too. These egregious claims that are flooding the marketplace, treat Alzheimer's, treat autism, treat Parkinson's, and those real serious health-related disease type of claims are, again, potentially compromising the integrity of that industry. And many of these CBD companies, by the way, are availing themselves of this direct selling business model because they see it as an opportunity to kind of grow their business and create some visibility in the marketplace, I think. Thanks for sharing that, Pete. Can you tell us a little bit more about DSSRC's relationship with state and federal regulators? Yeah, yeah, sure. The direct selling industry has has generally had this very nice, respectful relationship with the Federal Trade Commission. Let's start with them. And unlike NAD, which I know deals primarily with the FTC's Division of Advertising Practices, direct selling really falls within the regulatory auspices of the FTC's Division of Marketing Practices instead. DSSRC communicates regularly with the Division of Marketing Practices. And, you know, they've been supportive of our initiative. Uh, for example, they provided very valuable feedback regarding our earning claims guidance document. And they've spoken at our events, attended our meetings, and we send them our program activity reports, uh, which we publish twice a year. So we have a good level of communication, you know, with the uh, Federal Trade Commission. DSA also has a very active government affairs unit, and they have their own relationship with the Federal Trade Commission as well. By the way, the DSSRC has referred, I think it's 19 cases now 
to uh, the FTC and the Division of Marketing Practices regarding direct selling companies that choose not to participate in a forum. You know, on the state side, DSSRC has tried to create visibility by attending and speaking at a number of events. RAGA, the Republican Association of Attorney Generals, DAGA, the Democratic Association of Attorney Generals, AGA, the Attorney General Alliance. I spoke on a panel there in June, and I was joined by the Attorney General from Utah and the Assistant AG from New Mexico as well. Just last month, we had Sean Reyes, who's the um, Utah Attorney General, give the keynote at our uh, direct selling summit. So, the visibility that we're trying to create now with the states has really become a significant part of the work that we do, Eric. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the feedback that DSSRC is getting from consumers and industry? You know, the feedback that the program has received, it's been incredible. You know, again, we've only been around for three and a half years and the support that we've received from industry has just really been incredible. DSA has a very committed group of of members, and I think as a demonstration of that support, earlier this year, they asked DSSRC to also administer their own internal code of ethics, which I thought was a real strong showing of support. Last year, DSSRC was, was really privileged to receive an award from ICAS, the International Council of Advertising Self-Regulation, as the best new sectoral program. A lot of that was was really based on the the COVID work that the program had really kind of put out there, uh, as well as its monitoring of the entire industry. And the idea also, Eric, that a program like DSSRC could possibly be transposed into a larger European market, a larger Asian market, an African market. So I think that the judges, what they saw was a a pretty nimble, agile program that could also be utilized in in other territories. So we were definitely floored by the receipt of that award. Very humbling. So you mentioned that DSSRC was asked to administer the DSA's Code of Ethics, and that got me thinking about whether there has been any movement either from the DSA or from suggestions from regulators or industry about expanding DSSRC's role and and sort of priorities? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a great question, Annie. And I think the answer is yes. As I mentioned earlier, our jurisdiction right now is limited to the review of, of product and income claims. But the code of that, the DSA code of ethics also addresses a lot of other disciplines of direct selling, including inventory loading. For example, when a sales force member starts aggregating too much product, then they're able to sell. Things like illegal recruiting uh, of sales force members, things like that. So the idea now that DSSRC can start dipping its toe into some of these other prevalent industry issues is something that I think is very encouraging. And there's one other thing about this, Annie. We've recently been speaking with the World Federation for Direct Selling Associations, who looked at our model and what we were trying to do and thought that they may be able to use a similar model to address this much wider global group of direct selling associations. So what takeaways do you have for our audience who want to get into the direct selling space or have clients who are in this space? Yeah, you know, one of the things I love about this space is the entrepreneurial spirit that it was designed to cater to, really. Hey, this is a $35 billion industry, and that's just in the United States. You know, globally, we're talking about a $100 billion industry and millions of people who are involved in direct sales in one way or another. But if you're in it to get rich, you're going to the wrong place. However, if you're looking for an opportunity to maybe earn a little modest supplemental income, it's quite an interesting opportunity. Don't get in it to buy the mansion or the Ferrari or things like that. Then you're being misled. But again, if you're looking for a little bit extra spending money to pay one bill this month, maybe another bill a few months later, then it is a really interesting opportunity. But here's what I'd like to leave you with, that this is a very 
a very committed a group that's committed to doing things the right way, the industry professionals here. They've really embraced our self-regulatory initiative, and they want to see it work. You know, plenty of smart, enterprising uh, thought leaders with a very passionate consumer base. And this is such a great example about how self-regulation can collaborate with industry to improve their business and advertising practices. And, you know, really, it's, it's an incredible privilege to be the one who administers the program for the direct selling industry. And so we're all about making this program better and stronger here in the future. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today, Pete. I think we learned a lot about the direct selling industry and how self-regulation works in that industry. Thank you. Yeah, it was, you know what, Eric, what a pleasure to be joined by you and Andy, such seasoned professionals here, you know, in the self-regulatory space. So thank you so much for the invitation. No, it was great. And I'm sure people are going to learn a lot. So thank you. So Eric, why don't you give us a recap of some of the things that we talked about today? So today we learned about a how self-regulation works in a $35 billion industry uh, and that there is a, an effective self-regulatory body for that industry that's making a name for itself only after a few years and is really hitting the priorities of consumers and regulators. We've also learned about some trends in the industry with respect to the status of independent salespersons and also the possible expansion in the future because it's been so successful, as well as how it differs from NAD and some other self-regulatory programs. Thank you again for tuning into this episode of The Ad Watchers. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Peter Marinello. Join us next month for another episode of The Ad Watchers. As always, you can head over to our website, bbbprograms.org, to learn more about what we do at the National Advertising Division or any of our other self-regulatory programs like the DSSRC. That's all for this episode. See you next time.